Very happy to be with you here today. So many of you have come uh, to a day with Mary because you would like to receive a particular grace. And the grace might be for yourselves or for your family or for someone you love. And I know that Our Lady has such a tender heart that she wants to give you the graces that you need to go to heaven. I want to point to Our Lady who points us to Jesus. She says to us, do whatever he tells you. And in order for us to always be with Jesus, we have to put at the heart of our Christian life the memory of our baptism, because Jesus Christ came to die for sinners and he came to call us to the Father, that we have become children of God. This is a wonderful grace. So I want to talk today about the sacrament of confession and how Our Lady calls us to do whatever Jesus tells us to do. We have to be reminded constantly that we are baptized children of God. We are Christian. And that means that not only have our sins been washed away in baptism, but also we have been adopted as children of God. And therefore, we have to do all that we can to enter into the kingdom of God, because even though we are baptized, even though sin, original sin has been taken away from us, there's always a battle. And that battle is to do with our concupiscence, our tendency towards sin. We have an attraction towards sin, even though we don't want to. St. Paul said this beautifully in, in his letter to the Romans, I do what I don't want to do. My heart deeply desires to do the, what is good, but I find myself always doing that which is wrong. And so our Lord, in his great mercy, has instituted for us the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of confession. And I know that for you, for each of you, the sacrament of confession is extremely important. It is for us the way constantly back to the Holy Eucharist, constantly back to the kingdom of heaven. Many great exorcists throughout the centuries have said that a good confession is worth more than an exorcism because the devil hates confession more than anything. However, what does it mean for us to make a good confession? What does it mean for us to make a good confession? So, I mean, it's, it's all obviously very, very good to have many of you here as visitors as well. I should have said that I'm, uh, I'm not from this parish. You probably don't know that. Uh, I'm, I, I'm working at uh, Allen Hall, the diocesan seminary uh, in Westminster. My role is as pastoral director. So um, I'm very happy to be with you today. So I asked the question, what does it mean for us to make a good confession? Because it's not enough for us simply to go into the box, to go with a priest and say what our sins are. I want to give you an example of what I mean. Let's say we find someone who is a thief and they go into a shop and they steal something, a clock or watch, whatever they steal. Now they can get caught and they get prosecuted and they're brought before the, the judge and the judge gives them an exoneration. He frees the condemned man. Now that man is going to be happy because he's just been let off. But all it means is that he's now free to go ahead and steal again, unless there's been a real change of heart. And so at the heart of our confession is conversion, repentance, a change of heart. And this is why we need Our Lady so much, because she points to Jesus and she points us in the direction of a change of heart. I'm sure you know very well that Pope Leo XIII, on the 1st of October in 1884, had a vision at, towards the end of Mass where he saw Satan dialoguing with our Lord. And Satan asked for a challenge. Satan asked Jesus for the challenge to tempt the church into ruin. A bit like Satan did with Job in the book of Job. And it said that Jesus gave Satan permission for a hundred years to tempt the church, to strengthen the church in, in a sense. We can say that when, when Satan is given permission to tempt us or to tempt the church, it's for 
our good ultimately is because it's called it's a call to to grow in faith and to be strengthened and to resist the devil st peter says resist the devil and he will go away from you and we know that prayer the prayer that pope leo the 13th composed so well st michael the archangel you know it very well this was something like 30 35 years before our lady appeared to the seers in Fatima in 1917. And it's very interesting, we know very well that Our Lady said to the seers in Fatima, after showing them a vision of hell, she said, she explained, you have seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. And there you have in a nutshell what it means to make good confession, to have a heart which is orientated towards God and his divine will. So remember, 30 years prior, Pope Leo XIII had a prophetic vision of Satan beginning to tempt the church. And over the centuries, we've seen this happening. You know, that in 1917 in Russia, October 1917, there was a great uprising of the, of the, the, uh, the Bolsheviks, the, the, the Russian people, not all of them. And they overthrew the regime in Russia at that time and they introduced the beginnings of communism with its leaders. But we have to understand that before the October Revolution in 1917, there was a great and t terrible history in Russia of great persecution against the Jews who were in Russia at the time. The Jewish, the, 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 the aristocracy, the Tsars at the time had established what they call the pogroms. I don't know if you've heard of that word, it's a lovely word, pogrom, it's a terrible word. Ghettos where they forced the Jewish people to, to live and to dwell, they had to work there, and they were severely persecuted. And these somehow were the images of what was to come in communist Russia, of the concentration camps that developed there. But already Our Lady was seeing the terrible, terrible things that were happening in Russia, that hearts had been hardened towards the will of God. You know that a, a mortal sin is enough to send anyone to everlasting damnation. It's a terrible thing. If we die, the church teaches us this, it's not something we're inventing, we don't want to scare anybody, but if we die in a state of mortal sin, we lose eternally our vision of God. The fires of hell are prepared for us if we die obstinately against God. If our hearts are turned against God deliberately with full intention and full will. But to get to that state, to get to a state where we commit a terrible sin, a mortal sin, we have to commit lots of little sins, what we call venial sins. The venial sins are the sins which aren't so severe, but they are enough to somehow damage our relationship with our Lord. The very severe sins, the mortal sins, are linked to the Ten Commandments. And ultimately, they kill our, our divine life. But the venial sins, they, they injure. They don't kill. A venial sin might be something like we, we, we call a white lie or, or on omission. You know, so perhaps we, we see a beggar in the street and we, we, we fail to give them something that they need. So we omit to do something. Or in our thoughts, you know, we have judgments against somebody. How often have we come to church and we see someone in the church that we don't like, so we avoid them, we sit on the opposite side. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a venial sin because we're called to be reconciled with those that we don't find easy to get on with. And so we have to commit lots of venial sins for our hearts to become hardened. But what is a sin ultimately? A sin is, is based on pride. It's a rebellion against the nature of God. And God's nature is love. And so if we rebel against supreme love, then something in our spiritual life dies. 
And that's founded on pride. And who is the father of pride? It is Satan. And so Pope Leo XIII, already in the 19th century, in 1884, saw that pride was taking the hearts of many men and women in the church, not just the, in, the, in the West, but also in the East. So this prayer that he, he composed, so Michael the Archangel defend us in our battle, came for us as a warning. In a sense, this prayer, St. Michael the Archangel, is a call to repentance. I think it's important for me to say, in, in this one here, I always think that the enemy loves it when technology goes wrong because he doesn't want people to hear what we're saying. You know, when technology goes wrong, I'm very inspired because I know that I'm on the right track. You know, if, if the devil doesn't want me to speak, he'll, he'll switch off my microphone. Mm, it's true, isn't it? And so what, 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 is, what is repentance? I think it's really important for us to understand what repentance is. Repentance is not about keeping to the law, although it is part, partly that. Repentance is not simply about ticking boxes. I, if, we, if we go back to my earlier example of the thief, you know, if, if he keeps out of jail and he just makes sure that he doesn't steal anything, his heart is still orientated towards stealing. No, repentance means that we turn our hearts back to God, not out of fear, but out of love. To recognize that we are children of God, that we have a Father in heaven who not only loves us, but gives himself to us in his Son, Jesus Christ. He gives himself to us as our food. And so repentance is to, is to enter into humility. Now, sometimes we can be a little bit wrong in our understanding of what humility means. Sometimes we think when we say, oh, I'm, I'm a terrible sinner, I'm not very good at anything, we think that's humility. That's not always humility. Sometimes that can be pride. Some of us, some of you are called to do great things in the church. And you might say, oh, not me. Oh, I can't do anything great. Maybe you're called by the Lord to lead a prayer group. And you might say, oh, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. That's pride. It's not humility, because pride calls us to recognize that we don't have a Father in heaven. And humility calls us to recognize that Jesus Christ has not only died for our sins, but he has adopted us by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has brought us into the kingdom of God, that we are beloved sons and daughters of the Father. And so humility is to admit this, to say, yes, I am a child of God. And so when we sin, we say, I don't want to be there anymore. I want to turn back to my loving father. Imagine if you are eating a terrible meal. Maybe you're just eating some dry, rotten bread. And then someone offers you a banquet. And you say, no, no, I'm not good enough for the banquet. I'll just, I'm happy eating my little dry piece of bread. And the father is offering us through his son the banquet. And every one of us, you have a right to be at the banquet. And if we say, no, it's not for me, I don't have a father in heaven, God doesn't love me, then we have to save ourselves. We have to say, I have to defend myself against others. I have to defend myself against all the things that destroy me, that kill me. And so all of the political systems of the world, like communism and Marxism, all of these things, basically, at the, at the root of them is pride. At the root is a desire to save ourselves without God. Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict, when he was part of the, the uh, he formed part of a theological commentary on the third part of the Secret of Fatima, which was published on the 26th of June in 2000, he explained that in biblical language, the heart indicates the sense of human life, the point where reason, will, temperament, and sensitivity converge. To be devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary means, therefore, to embrace this attitude of heart which makes the fiat 
What is the fear? Be it done unto me according to your word. Be it done unto me. Lord, let your will be done. What do we hear so often today? I feel, therefore I am. I feel, therefore I am. You know, I feel that I have to have my rights and therefore it is right. You know, I, I feel something in my heart. I feel I'm right. You know, and, that, and that's not always a bad thing. But sometimes what we feel isn't right. We see it in the way that we understand marriage, for example, today. People might say today, I feel that it's right for me to do what I want in marriage. I can get divorced. I can marry somebody I'm not supposed to marry. I feel it, and therefore I can do it. And you can't stop me. And if you stop me from doing that, then there's something wrong with you. It means you're a bigot. Or if I want to change my appearance, then I can do it. You can't change me. Satan just loves to attack the human family. He loves to attack the image of, of the dignity of, of fatherhood. He wants to completely ruin what it means to be a woman. A woman. I don't know if you know the, 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 the pop star. Um, there was a very, I went to say her name. There was a very famous pop star. She said, I'm, I'm proud to be a woman. Because she was a woman. And so many people were offended by that. How dare you say you're proud to be a woman? The devil hates the image of, of man. He hates the image of woman. He hates the image of the family. He also hates the image of the church. And he wants nothing more than to destroy the church, to destroy the image of our Holy Father, and to destroy the image of Our Lady and her Immaculate Heart. This is why there's so many blasphemies against her immaculate heart, against images in her likeness. And so when we say, be it done to me according to your word, what we're saying is that I'm not in charge. God is in charge. Even those people who want to take their lives, even people who want to kill themselves because life is unbearable and it's terrible, people who want to, to kill themselves, unbearable what we now call euthanasia, sweet death, it's a, it's a misnomer. Even then, we, we don't know the hour of our death, really. Only God can take life. Only God knows the hour of our death. And so, Satan, he said, I will not serve. I will not serve. Pride. And he looks for people to follow him. I will not serve. My will be done. And this is the constant scene running throughout history. And this somehow, there's a great danger that this can enter into the church today. My will be done. You know, one of the extraordinary phenomena today in the church is that people get easily offended. You know, I, if you speak to a lot of priests, it's very difficult to preach today because people get easily offended when we speak the truth. I don't know if you've found that in your own families when you speak the truth, you can get offended. People get offended. And the reason why we get offended is because we want people to do what we want. We want to control others. We want them to, to be according to our image and likeness. But what did Our Lady say? She said, be it done to me according to your word. And Pope, and, and Pope Benedict, he goes on to say, the defining center of one's whole life is this, the heart open to God, purified by contemplation of God, is stronger than guns and weapons of every kind. You know, this war that's happening in Russia today in Ukraine, at the heart of it is pr human pride to gain power. I'm sure you know already, it's quite an extraordinary thing that the bishops of the Ukraine have asked that Russia and the Ukraine be consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I don't even know this. It's, it's a wonderful, a wonderful thing, an inspiration. Because when Our Lady first asked for this, 
Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. So it's important that we, we pray for this. We, we pray that Russia and Ukraine can be consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Because this can be a great sign in the world that, that all hearts can be turned back to God. That we're able to put up with each other. Not to be easily offended, you know, not to take offense so easily. To, to, get, to make excuses for our brothers and sisters. And so we are called in this journey, in this battle against the evil one, to constantly turn back to repentance and faith, constantly to repent, go back to the Lord again and again and again. And don't wait until you commit a big sin. Make regular confession. I know that Pope John Paul II would go to confession on a weekly basis. And he's a saint in heaven. You know, we have, to, we have to make ourselves a nuisance to the priests. We have to go to confession on a regular basis. And it's not just simply about telling our sins like a laundry list, but to look deeply into our hearts and to ask ourselves, where have I been proud? Where have I taken offense? Where have I wanted my will to be done? Where have I somehow tried to get God to do my will? How often our prayers can be a manipulation of the will of God. God, do my will. We go back to Our Lady and we look at her immaculate heart and she says, Fiat, fiat, let what you have said be done to me. And at the foot of the cross, when Our Lady was standing there looking at Jesus crucified, she said, Fiat, fiat, let your will be done. Let your will be done. So I hope that in this talk that I've given today, you can take something from this. That is that we are called to repent to turn to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And I mentioned at the beginning, I said to some of you who are from this parish, you're like the salt, you're like the salt in this parish. Each one of you is called to be salt in the world, to repent on a daily basis. Repent, repent. Believe in the good news. That God the Father loves you. He has sent his, his Son, Jesus Christ, to call you out of sin and to, and to claim you for, for, for the kingdom of heaven. So let us now turn to our Lord, and I hope you can say with me, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, a prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Ave Maria. Mm -hmm.